can they continue to keep making big plays downfield when they don't have a wide receiver like uh, Chris Godwin, who moved on to the NFL draft to the Tampa Bay Bucks? So that's a question mark. And Michigan loses a lot of players, but again, you, you know, look at one of the matchups they have at the end of the year that will be on Big Fox is, is Ohio State Michigan. They've got the Buckeyes coming to their house. A couple of the road tests uh, early in the year, Penn State and Wisconsin, but Michigan could easily make a run if some of those, you know, more inexperienced guys grow up quick. You know, James Franklin has done a terrific job fighting off the sanctions and the Joe Paterno kind of shadow. And I look at the SEC right now. Texas A&M could be a year away from a new coach. I think Tennessee is going to struggle this year. These are these are I mean, Tennessee is a blue blood Southern program. Uh, Georgia, Kirby Smart's got to win this year or you're going to start hearing the wind blow. I look at James Franklin, and I think he is so valuable to the Big Ten. Do you, and, but I think the SEC would pay $5 million to get him. Is James Franklin, is he a Big Ten or an SEC coach in two years? I think he's still a Big Ten coach, and I think he's going to have continued success at Penn State, and that's one of the reasons why I think he's going to want to continue to stay there. And, and I don't necessarily see a job coming open in the next you know two years in the SEC that he would want to leave Penn State for, given everything he's been able to build with that program. And, and I think the Big Ten's going to hope he at least wants to hang on, only because he's such a dynamic personality. You know, you listen to him, coach. You listen to the way he recruits and the way he speaks to people. Even today at the Big Ten media days, I mean, he's just got an electric person. Personality. So I don't necessarily see him, you know, leaving to go to, you know, be a head coach for a team in the SEC West, right? I mean, Old Miss, that job is probably going to be open after this upcoming year. Uh, I just don't see why you'd want to enter into a job that seems like an uphill battle having to play against Alabama every year, where at Penn State, you just beat Ohio State and Urban Meyer last year. You won the Big Ten championship. So I think he's already kind of put his footprint on the Big Ten. I don't see why you'd want to leave in a year or two. Brady Quinn finally at the Big Ten uh, media days today. Harbaugh is, um, he can have kind of a rigid, clunky personality. Urban Myers played this game. James Franklin, big personality. <laughs> Mike Riley, Lovey Smith. But Harbaugh's different. His relationship, he and I had a bad interview. He's a different cat. When you're at the Big Ten Media Days, and you most I thought it was a great interview, Colin. <laughs> I thought it was a fantastic one. It's the most listened to, not the best I've ever by, done. By the way, Colin, you'll, you'll want to know, at one point, at one point during the luncheon today, he was actually trying on the Michigan helmet that was in front of him <laughs> on the table while other coaches are sitting up there listening to him. He was actually putting on the helmet to try it on, which it seemed to fit uh, quite well. Was he the rock star today? I guess my question, because he's so unique and so intense that he's part player, part coach. Was he kind of the rock star today? I think he always is, at least as of right now, because when he speaks or when he's getting ready to speak, everyone seems to sit on the edge of their seat to say, like, what is he going to say now? And and I think, you know, Joel Klatt, who is part of our college football crew, a number one analyst, he actually hosted today's lunch, did a tremendous job, and he asked him a question uh, as far as what was one of his best moments from their trip to Rome, which is something that's unique in itself. And, and he actually said that that trip was his greatest experience uh, in his entire time coaching football, which I thought was pretty unique considering a guy who's been incredibly successful, a guy who's been to a Super Bowl, won an NFC championship with the San Francisco 49ers. It was that trip that he called his best experience with a football team in his career. And I think it just goes to show you he's a, a unique personality. He thinks in different ways, is incredibly innovative, and he just captivates a room because there's that big question mark of what is he going to say next or how is he going to connect this and make it all come together. He's, he's, he's incredible for the Big Ten, and Michigan obviously is incredibly lucky to have him. All right, Brady Quinn, good stuff, man. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. You bet. Uh, Pac-12 camps going on here, uh, media days in Los Angeles. Yeah, Harbaugh's really, really a unique person. Uh, James Franklin, though, listen, Michigan and Ohio State are always going to pay big money for their coaches. The Penn State story, I don't think we quite understand how valuable James Franklin has been. If you go look at the history of college sports, I covered UNLV basketball post-Tark. They almost never bounce back. I mean, look how long it's taken USC to be a preseason top two or three. Like Sandusky, Paterno, controversy, rural Pennsylvania, infighting, people going to jail, senators involved, governors. This was an absolute mess. And like three years later, Penn State is loaded. Like, I'm going to tell you something. Nothing against Harbaugh and Urban Meyer. The best coach in college football 
and over the last couple of years, dealing with headaches and limitations and the shadow of an icon and controversy and seeding it. And like Penn State just bounced right back. I would have never guessed that Penn State, you know, kind of three years into James Franklin, can play with anybody in America. And they can, including Alabama. They can play. Listen, USC is as good as anybody this year, and they had USC beat. Like, I, the, the story in the Big Ten to me is not Harbaugh. It's what James Franklin has done to make them a top ten program again. And I think they're loaded this year. I think their schedule is brutal. I mean, tip of the cap to that guy. Tip of the cap to James Franklin. Because I covered UNLV, and a lot of you have been fans of programs that have controversy. And it, you go into a 10-year abyss. And Penn State's controversy was more divisive and creepier. And it went deeper into the program and deeper into the administration. And it was more polarizing. Bounced right back. Good for them. We're going to go to Cowboy Camp around the corner. If you're looking to sell your car, there's a new better way to do it. True Car, fast, easy, best way to price your car from the comfort of home. When you're ready to experience a better way to sell or trade in your car, check out truecar.com slash trade today. That was you a good know, ad, by the way. That was a really well-written ad. And uh, I'm still struggling with burglary. Yes. I think it's like jewelry. Like some, It's hard to say sometimes jewelry and burglary. It's bur- burglary. Burglary. Yeah. Burglary. <laughs> yes. um, good to have you in the herd today. We're going to go live to Cowboy Camp. Uh, we've got some video from Oxnard, California. I mistakenly called it Oxford. That's Mississippi. <laughs> Old Miss scandal. Uh, Oxnard, California. So the Cowboy Camp. There's Dak Prescott. You're looking right now. I know this doesn't do much for our radio audience, but that is uh, there's Des Bryant nice hat. racing for a touchdown in beautiful Oxnard, California, up by uh, warm and toasty Thousand Oaks. God, isn't that great? Up in Thousand Oaks. You live up there in Thousand Oaks. You look out your window, and it's the Dallas Cowboys. So we'll go to uh, a reporter for the Dallas Morning News, one of the last great American sports pages and newspapers, here in about 10 minutes. You know, I was thinking about this. I, I, I've, I've never been in this position, but I always I hear stories about people that have to carry their family, and they've got the dysfunctional dad. And the. I think one of the saddest things is when you hear about young people and the mom was – uh, you know, an alcoholic and the dad was abusive. And I'm always amazed when people like kids have to take control of their family and literally have to at 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, have to, I never had to deal with this, but they have to really be the dad and the mom and get the kids ready for school. And you hear stories about this all the time um, about people that have to sort of carry a family. And um, I always just go, God, what a, what a burden. And I think sometimes, even though Tom Brady's great, I don't feel like he has to carry the burden of the Patriots. Belichick's a great coach. They draft well. They acquire free agents. He doesn't worry about the defense. Tom may be great, but Tom knows if he shows up to practice, works hard, and does his job, they can win. You know, the the Patriots' defense in that last Super Bowl kept getting Atlanta off the field in three and out, three and out, three and out, making – the defense more tired for Tom. The defense did Tom a lot of favors in the Super Bowl. But think about LeBron James. Think about his existence in Cleveland. So the day before, the year before LeBron James arrived in Cleveland, they were 17-65. and That's almost impossible to do in the NBA. They were worse than, they were Brooklyn bad. Then he shows up and for seven years they go to the playoffs for five years. Then LeBron leaves and overnight, the 60-win team was 97-215. and Then LeBron comes back to the Cleveland family for three years. They get to the finals three years in a row, and they win one. And now, if you wake up this morning, D. Rose is signed with the Cavs. And if Kyrie Irving leaves, your roster is a series of old guys, overpaid guys, and guys who can't defend. Kyle Korver, J.R. Smith, Tristan Thompson, Channing Fry, Kevin Love, Derek Rose. You wonder why sometimes LeBron cryptically sends messages? He has to carry this franchise. The day before he arrives, they're awful. He arrives, they're good. He leaves a championship competing team. They're awful for four years. 
They get they get three lottery picks in four years, butcher two of them. Then he comes back and they win again. And this morning he wakes up and Kyrie's like, I, I want to get out of here. I'm going to give LeBron the right to take a deep sigh and think, bruh, how long do I have to carry this franchise? I put us all together again. I mean, good God, folks. In the last 20 years, the only time Cleveland's not humiliating itself is when LeBron is there. So, yeah, he's probably a little testy with Kyrie Irving. He's probably a little testy. I get it. Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. You remember Chauncey Billups? He interviewed for the Cavs president job last month and ultimately took his name out of the running. Yes, I do remember that. Well, he says now that he knew while he was interviewing that Kyrie Irving was unhappy. Here he is. It didn't really surprise me. Um, obviously, I knew, you know, as they were doing their due diligence on me, I was doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, I, I knew I knew um, so much about the situation that, that, you know, the rest of the world doesn't know. Um, but that's unfortunate, man, because he's a, he's a special talent, in, in my opinion. You know, so much of what he's been able to accomplish on and off the floor has been He's been a beneficiary of having LeBron James, man. That would be alarming to me if I was a team looking to get him. Now, that's really interesting. Chauncey, Stan, if I was a GM and I'm inheriting Kyrie and he's not happy with that situation, what the hell is he happy with? Well, he said that the reason why, the ultimate reason why, was that whether or not LeBron left, he didn't think that they had great assets if you were going to try to do a rebuild if LeBron wound up moving on. That's fair. That, but I, I, I still think, think I still would stay for one more year and get to the finals again. Well, maybe what Chauncey saw in the Cavs, maybe not having a plan for their future, Kyrie also sees and wants to get a step ahead. Am I starting to get to you a little bit? Not really. Not even at all? Not me, Greg Jennings? Sounds nothing. spoiled to me. <laughs> well, you, well, you're maids if they're <laughs> 10 minutes late. God. <laughs> uh, okay, you're going to love this. And I think we're going to be on two different sides. So Marcus Mariota, um, he's ended his first two seasons early because of injury. Yeah. So the Titans say that they would like him to gain weight so that he can absorb hits better. Yeah. Meanwhile, his personal trainer says he'd like him to lose weight so that he can run faster and avoid them. So which is better? Do you run or you absorb the hits? You absorb the hits. Absolutely. Why do you say that? This is just something I've talked to a lot of quarterbacks about. And um, I have a friend, Brock Heward, who played in the NFL uh, briefly, and he just couldn't put on weight. The NFL quarterbacks need to be built like Matt Stafford and Andrew Luck. Mm-hmm. They're kind of, they got pudding. Well, look at Andrew Luck, though. He's like bleeding well, out of his eyeball or yeah, something. But that just shows you if he was a smaller athlete, how long would he last? Trent Dilford told me this years ago quarterbacks, if you've got abs, get rid of them. Put pudding on because he goes, you're going to be so beat up. Trent told me he would, there would be practices where he would take harder hits than college games. So put some pudding on. Don't don't be a swimsuit model in the NFL as a quarterback. If you want to be a corner or a receiver, let me see the abs. As a quarterback, put on an extra eight pounds. I'm trying to think if Tom Brady has abs. I no, he say, doesn't. You think he has kind of a, a gut? No, but he's got a big. He's got a butt. He's got. He's thick. Tom's thick. Have you seen him? In, <laughs> he does. He's what got, does a butt have to do with that? He's just. He's 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 big solid. thighs, solid. Skinny and ab- like RG three, a great example. RG three had abs. Uh-huh. RG three could not stay healthy. Hmm. You you you're gonna absorb a like I, when I look at Marcus Mariota, he looks light to me. This is giving a lot of men a lot of confidence to be a great quarterback. You don't have to have abs. No, in bake, fact, you shouldn't. Baked potatoes, French fries, <laughs> French dip sandwiches regularly. Perfect. And finally, Jim Harbaugh was at the Big Ten Media Day, and he said that he would like his quarterback to be very loud. And so, of course, he gave a demonstration. Be loud. It's really easy. Ah! Be loud. You know? <laughs> Blue 80! Blue 80! That's the easiest thing about being a quarterback. Everything he does is so entertaining. <laughs> I like him. Yeah. Good so, talking uh, That's how he would like his, his quarterback to be. I wonder if he does that like one-on-one with them. Oh, I think he does crazy stuff all the time. <laughs> that's the news. Chris, team of the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Lie News. Let's go to Oxnard via the Coward Global Satellite Network. Dallas Morning News Cowboy Reporter. 
John Machoda is joining.